All right, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another session uh, as part of our 2021 Virtual Outdoor Expo this week, hosted by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. We are presenting these virtual sessions on Facebook Live this week, and also make sure to check out, if you can't watch live, we'll be archiving all of this content on the PFBC YouTube page and our website, fishandboat.com, in the coming days. If you want to find out what's still to come, now through Friday, you can find a schedule of all of our remaining events for the week on our Facebook page. Just check down the feed. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Parker, the Communications Director for the agency, and we are excited to bring you this session this morning called Kayaking 101. We're wondering what is behind Pennsylvania's fastest growing boating trend. I'm pleased to welcome in several experts in the area of recreational boating safety and education. First is Ryan Walt, the Fish and Boat Commission's Boating and Watercraft Safety Manager. We have Adam Spangler, the PFBC's South Central Region Education Specialist, and Christine Ticehurst is a Recreation and Interpretation Program Coordinator for the DCNR's Bureau of State Parks. So welcome to all of you this morning. Thank you. Hey, good morning. morning. All right. And a reminder to anyone who's watching as we stream live on Facebook this morning, your questions and comments are welcomed. We're going to try to get to as many relevant questions as we can as we talk with our experts over the next 40 to 45 minutes or so. Do remember, though, you can find a lot of the answers to many of our frequently asked questions about boating and paddling safety by visiting our website, fishandboat.com. So to kick things off, let's spend a little time here just getting to know our guests and who's on our panel this morning. Christine, we'll start with you. If you don't mind, tell us about your role with the DCNR's Bureau of State Parks. Sure thing. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, I work with the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, also known as DCNR. I work within our Bureau of State Parks. Um, my position is based in Harrisburg. However, I work statewide as a support staff to our environmental educators at all of our state parks across the state. So for those that don't know, we have 121 state parks and about 20 state forest districts across the state with over 2 million public acres of public land for people to get out and explore. And it's a wonderful agency to work with. So thanks so much for having me. And I'm really excited to talk about some kayaking adventures out in Pennsylvania today. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us and making the time. Ryan, same question for you. What do you do as the Fish and Boat Commission's Boating and Watercraft Safety Manager? Hey, good morning, Mike. Uh, I have a couple of different responsibilities. Um, one of the primary ones is being the boating accident review officer. So any accident that happens in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, I get eyes on it and I'm a li liaison to the Coast Guard, uh, as well as manage the uh, Commonwealth Swift Water Rescue Program, uh, involved in a lot of boating safety messaging and uh, endeavors throughout the course of the year. So pretty much if it has to do with boating and it comes through the commission, uh, I'll, I'll have my hands on it at some point in time. But uh, glad to be here this morning and uh, hoping we can get some good information out to, to all the folks out there. All right. Thanks, Ryan. And Adam, finally, you. How about explaining your role as a regional education specialist for the Fish and Boat Commission? Okay. So I cover um, the South Central 13 counties in the South Central region, um, doing the education for the Fish and Boat Commission as far as fishing, uh, boating, paddling, and um, reptiles and amphibians. So I get to do a lot of different educational activities. I work a lot with the state parks, some of the, the education staff there, and then also all, all types of different organizations such as Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and uh, church groups, um, all kinds of things um, that I get to get to do. So it's pretty, pretty broad, but I also concentrate a lot on safety and fishing safety and um, it's a good, good time. All of you have a lot of boating and, and specifically paddling experience, so I think you're uh, definitely um, a wealth of resources here today, for, for knowledge and resources for everyone tuning in. So we're going to get to a bunch of questions. Uh, we have some coming in on Facebook already. Uh, we're going to go through a, a few questions that we have that are frequently asked to see if we can cover some things here off the top. So as we jump into this discussion about kayaking, I guess we should explain why we chose to focus on it here with its own session today. And I guess simply put, kayaking as a boating activity has skyrocketed across Pennsylvania over the past decade, probably even a little bit longer than that. But statistically, we know that since 2010, for instance, sales of Fish and Boat Commission launch permits 
has increased by more than 400%. And last year alone, no surprise, those sales experienced a big increase, a year-to-year -year increase from the previous year, 2019. In 2020, we saw a nearly 40% jump. So we know that there are a lot of new kayakers and paddlers out there. And we do also know that this increase was partly due to COVID-19 as individuals and families were looking to get out and find new safe ways to experience the outdoors. So Adam, we'll stick with you. Why do you think so many people are discovering or rediscovering kayaking? Um, I think the main reason, Mike, that um, you see a lot of people kayaking is it's a convenient activity. Um, you can do it as a family. Um, to get your resources to actually do that, your life jackets and boats is relatively inexpensive um, compared to other activities that you could get involved with. So I think that's why we see a big jump in those activities close to home that you can do. Pennsylvania has lots of bodies of water for paddling, so it's a great, great activity to do. Ryan, a lot of questions about equipment. And so, you know, someone who does a lot of training and is involved in that side of things with safety. Let's talk about the different types of kayaks that are out there for someone who may be new um, or considering changing up styles. What kind of styles are out there? How do I know what is best for me? Yeah, well, we'll hit a couple of those points here. There's, you know, tons of makes, manufacturers of, of kayaks and, and paddle boards out there. Uh, one of the things you have sit on top kayaks, uh, angler specific kayaks, whitewater kayaks, touring kayaks, uh, racing kayaks, et cetera. So there's pretty much they make a boat for any type of niche activity that you would want to get into. Um, in addition to that, they make all the accessories for these boats as far as what if we're talking about fishing kayaks, um, rod holders, um, you know, tackle box cases, et cetera. In addition, then you have the life jacket side uh, for the safety, the U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket that's mandatory to have on board your, your kayak. Um, all different types of makes, manufacturers, designs. So uh, whenever we talk about unpowered boating or kayaking, it's a broad term, but the market has really cut that stuff into uh, niche pieces so people can find exactly uh, what they're looking for. And a good recommendation is to go to an outfitter. Um, here in Harrisburg, uh, we have Blue Mountain Outfitters. So they specialize in all different types of uh, kayaking, canoeing, et cetera. And they're gonna be a subject matter experts and you can explain to them what you're looking for and they'll set you up with, uh, with that type of product. And, and there's outfitters uh, all over the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So that would be a recommendation. Go to those subject matter experts that deal with um, you know, canoes, kayaks, and uh, and get the right information. Yeah, it used to be that buying a kayak was sort of a process where you had to seek out a someone that specifically sold boating equipment or an outfitter like that. But now, almost everywhere you go, you can drive by the uh, you know the local sort of big box sporting goods place, maybe even a local hardware store. And they'll, they're, they're selling kayaks. And not to say that you can't make a purchase there, but you're just saying that someone who specializes in it might have a little bit more experience in getting someone started. Yeah, absolutely. And they're going to be able to set you up with uh, any type of entry level training, uh, you know, learning programs, uh, some different paddling programs. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good place to start. You might not purchase your product there, but at least you're talking to somebody that uh, understands what, what exactly you're in the market for. All right. Andy Desco is our producer today. He's uh, our Southeast Region Education Specialist, and he's behind the scenes for us today uh, as we stream here on Facebook. And Andy, I'm going to ask you as I ask this next question to load up uh, a video that we have prepared. So, Dean, uh, I'm just going to ask you to sort of set this one up because this is this is a video that, that you did through the DCNR last summer. One of the most convenient places, as people know, to go kayaking is at their local state park. As Ryan mentioned, a lot of these backyard places that are now being explored. Many of the state parks have beautiful lakes. This past summer, you took part in, in a video for novice paddlers, and we're gonna take a few minutes to watch that video right now. My name is Mindy. 
and I'm Christine and we're with the Pennsylvania State Parks and today we're going to talk to you a little bit about some basic kayaking tips. Before you head out onto a state park lake there's a few things that you need to keep in mind. First you should file a float plan which basically just means that you're telling somebody else where you're going, how long you're expected to be out and what time you'll probably be home. You want to make sure that it's not uh, going to thunderstorm anytime soon when you're going to be out on the lake and keep in mind that you could be out on the lake much longer than you anticipate. So with that you also want to dress appropriately for the weather as well as for the water temperature. Uh, so keeping in mind that you could end up in the water, uh, lightweight, very fast drying clothing is a really good option to choose. So some of the things that you will definitely need while you're out on the water is a properly fitting PFD along with a whistle in case of an emergency. In addition, a good sized dry bag to add in some of your extra items that you might want. Some of your snacks, medication, um, an extra layer of clothing in case it gets cold or it's raining, water, as well as a first aid kit. And then some other things that you might want to bring with you if you have the room. A bilge pump in case you get some extra water in your kayak. If you're staying out longer, you might want to have a flashlight. If it's really sunny out, you definitely want to have some sunglasses. When going out into the water, one of the first things you're going to think about is the length of the kayak. So we have a couple different lengths here. The first in the middle is actually one we recommend for beginners. It's a 10 foot length. Um, it's pretty stable. It's easy to maneuver. Um, it's a very fast kayak. If you go to my left here, we have a slightly shorter kayak. This is an eight foot. It's a lot more maneuverable in the water, but it's a lot less stable as well. If you go to the right here, you have the most stable kayak. It's a little bit bigger, it's a 12 foot. It's a little slower though, and it might be harder for smaller people to paddle, but it's an excellent kayak for fishing. Once you've gotten into your boat and you have your seat adjusted appropriately for your comfort, you want to make sure that your legs are sitting comfortably as well. There are foot pegs that are in most boats that can be adjusted. So I have mine uh, increase that allows for my knees to bend just slightly and I'll have my knees and my legs displayed to the side of the boat and rest there while I'm out on the water. When entering your kayak, it's important to maintain three points of contact at all times, which means either two feet and a hand on a kayak or both hands and one foot um, on the ground for stability. If you're having trouble and your kayak's moving around just a little too much, you can put your paddle down to kind of help stabilize your kayak as you enter. So in order to correctly hold your paddle, you're going to want to take your finger and your thumb to wrap around your paddle and then just gently rest the other fingers around. You're also going to want to hold your paddle so that when you hold it above your head, your arms would form an almost 90 degree angle, whatever feels the most comfortable for you. Your paddle should also be facing so that the spoon shape is going backwards. That's going to help you move through the water a lot easier. There should be a longer end as well and that should be on top. Your basic stroke is your forward stroke. So you're reaching out and you're pulling the paddle back parallel along with your boat. That's gonna keep you moving forward. In order to turn your kayak, you're gonna make a sweeping motion with your paddle on the opposite side that you wanna turn. To paddle backwards, you don't wanna flip your paddle. You just wanna go in the opposite motion as forward. If you need to move your boat in closer to the shore, you can pull the water perpendicular to the boat with the stroke. When you're finished paddling, it's important to clean, drain, and dry your equipment to help stop the spread of invasive plants and animals to our natural areas. We hope you stay safe and you enjoy paddling in our state parks. For more information, check out the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission's boater safety courses, as well as DCNR's calendar events for upcoming kayak programming. Have fun! All right, so really well done video there. Uh, looked like a pretty nice day. Some weather that we wouldn't mind having right about right about now, right, Christine? So that's right. I was just going to say that I'm looking outside the window and it's, it's all white. So to see some green and some water to get out onto, I'm looking forward to the spring. All right. So to follow up on that presentation, let's ask about the state parks. Did you, did you see a lot of new paddlers last year? And would you say that a state park, specifically maybe a lake, is a good place for people to start if they're getting into kayaking? Yes and yes. 
to both questions. Yes, we've had a tremendous increase in visit popular or um, visitation at our parks. Um, kayaking is one of the sort of most uh, inclusive recreations, I think. Um, you know, you don't need a whole lot. Uh, the equipment that's, that's available uh, through our state parks, through our programming, um, we have them available for public programming. So you don't need any equipment. Um, once we are offering those programming again in the season, we have the PFDs available, the kayaks available, your paddles. Um, and then we also have adaptive equipment. So for individuals that might be limited in mobility, um, we do have some equipment that has um, extra support for your, your torso, um, adaptive paddle structures that you can use. So if you have a limited uh, strength in your arms, so you can still get out and enjoy the recreation portion on the water. Um, so State Parks is a great place to start that that learning opportunity in kayaking. It's a safe location. Um, our educators are fantastic and will work with you to walk you through those learning opportunities. Uh, but right now during the winter, a great way to sort of begin that research is looking online. Um, the ACA, the American Canoe Association, is a wonderful resource for virtual information, uh, some videos and educational information for you to get started. So there's lots to do during this winter time to get you ready for uh, springtime kayaking. Good. Yeah, I always found that uh, with my, my family recently got into kayaking and we have two young children. And it was nice to be able to sort of stick along the shoreline of the, you know, and, uh, and, and, I, and I will say this too, just because it's a lake doesn't mean that the water is always going to be calm. There can be wind and that can play a big factor. But mm -hmm. when you can stick along the shoreline, and sort of get your bearings, especially if you have a new craft, uh, that's a good, that is a good place to start. And also there's typically, if not even state park staff around, just maybe other people around with other kids that maybe you may be able to look at them and ask them a couple of questions. Yeah, definitely. Yep, you're right. Starting out on the lake along the edge is a great spot. Um, if you want to find a location that has um, little to no current. Um, you don't have any wake from, say, a boat with a, an engine. Um, so there's a lot of really nice little alcoves that you can get into and begin to learn the basic paddling and check out to see who else is out there for so, some other pointers. You know, there's some other people out on the water that you can take some, um, some techniques from. Always love turtle watching. That's another great part yeah. about paddling along the edge of a, of a lake. <laughs> yeah. Adam, next question for you as we talk about paddling out on, you know, still water or a, a lake. A lot of people wanted though experience that relaxing float down their local creek or river. So how are those two experiences different? And how should people prepare for kayaking out on the moving water? Adam? Mike, so the lakes are a great place to start, especially if you're a new new paddler, new to the sport, you, know, you have new equipment. I definitely um, recommend everyone starts out on non-moving water. And then if you want to move to a, a creek or a river, um, I find someone or that has done it before or do a lot of research yourself to find all your access points to that, that stream, creek or river. Um, make sure you know where there, if there's any um, hazards on that water, um, put a float plan in or let someone know where you're going, how long you plan to float down that, the river and when you plan to be back and always go again, always go with somebody. Um, that's the best, the best thing you can do. The, a lake is a great place though. I always recommend to start there. All of my paddling programs that I do are on non-moving water uh, for beginners. Uh, for safety reasons, making sure you have a life jacket that you are comfortable wearing um, that fits you properly will make your trip so much more enjoyable when you float down that that river. And Adam, talk about also water conditions and how that can play a factor. And if you're unfamiliar um, you know, with what, what well, I'll, I'll put it this way, it doesn't take a lot of water to to float in, just a couple of inches. So but once the water is a certain height, you know, there, there, there's sort of a prime spot that you want to be in there as compared to really low water or really high water. And tell people about that sweet spot and the, the problems that are associated with all of those. 
So you want you want to again check the weather. If they're calling for a lot of rain, the the height of a, a lake can change, um, as well as the height of a creek or or a river. You never want to be paddling out there in flood stages or when the when the water is really high. Uh, when the water is really low, your experience might be scraping the bottom or sliding across some of those rocks when you're going down the stream. It might not be as enjoyable. Um, you want to make sure you're boating on that water when it's at ideal length. And that, that can vary depending on the body of water. And again, that's why you want to make sure you're doing your research um, on the body of water you're going to and using. We have tons of resources on our website from our paddling, paddling trails, water trail guides to our interactive um, county maps where you can find all the boating accesses and, and put ins and takeouts for, for those streams. Um, the US Coast Guard, um, there is a um, place where you can check the, the depth of the water, different streams and rivers. Um, so those are things to, to look at as well. Yeah, you can spend a lot of time walking and moving your kayak around rocks and low spots if you go when it's too low. And if it's too high, it just gets a little bit scary. The other thing I noticed too, and maybe you've experienced this, but people of different weights tend to float at different speeds. I find that when I'm kayaking with my with my children and my wife, that it's it's not difficult for them to sort of get, I don't know if it's, it has to do with the wind or just the current, but the kids, it doesn't take long for the kids to get out 50 yards ahead of you. And then all of a sudden you start, start worrying as opposed to, uh, you know, relaxing and having a good time. Is that something to look out for? Mike, I think that that might be affected by the different equipment um, and by the amount of weight that you have in, in your in your vessels or your boats. The more weight you put in that boat, the the maybe the less quickly that boat will move through the water or cut through the water compared to someone who's lighter. There isn't as much of resistance on the bottom of that boat um, or drag in the water. So that's why you might see some of the kids being able to paddle a little quicker than the adults in some kayaks. Yeah, that's just definitely something for families to look out for, mm -hmm. especially if you don't know that there's obstacles ahead and things like that. You just want to always keep an eye on them because the group can get separated, whether it's kids or a group of adults. Getting separated can be a little bit of a, a, a strange feeling when you're out there, especially on, an, on a moving water. Mike, Mike so to touch on that, um, you always want to have someone in front and someone behind and keep everyone together, especially if you're going out in the group, have a leader and no one goes past that leader and they have someone at the tail end of that group that keeps everyone in line, especially on moving water. If you have a big group, we have taken all different sizes of groups out and you always have someone in front that doesn't let anyone go past them. And then someone in the back that brings up the end to make sure there's no one um, lagging behind. Sounds like a smart plan. Ryan, let's talk about some of the dangers associated with kayaking that people should be aware of. And from a safety standpoint as our expert here today, what would you say are some of the most common reasons that, I don't know, people find themselves in a little bit of trouble out on the water? Yeah, one of the primary things is people underestimating the power of water. All right, you had already uh, touched base on as far as flood stage versus low water uh, events, but a lot of folks under underestimate the power of water. And then if you're in moving water, kayaking down, you have uh, all different types of hazards that you need to be aware of, low head dams, uh, strainers, sweepers, and those are more or less uh, trees or obstacles in the water that can take you off your boat. Um, some other reasons folks get into trouble is, you know, it's, it's mandatory to have a U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket on board your kayak, um, but you should also wear it at all times. Uh, having that inherently buoyant life jacket, if you find yourself in the water, uh, it's going to uh, increase your chance of, of getting out of there uh, uninjured. Some other things that folks should be aware of, um, and Adam touched on this, is just being familiar with the water trail or the body of water that you're uh, going out on. There's a lot of resources out there as you touch base on, and having knowledge of that information before you go out, as well as uh, the river levels, you had mentioned about looking at the USGS real-time stream uh, stream currents and keeping an eye on that is going to help you be a lot safer out there. 
Ryan, I, I also want to talk about the, uh, the danger of, you know, it's, it's pretty common. I've, I've, I've seen it myself. I, I know that, uh, you, you know, you can, during the summer months, scroll through your own personal Facebook feed and see some people enjoying a kayak trip, which is great. But then you might also see a can of beer, a bottle of wine, whatever. So what I'm trying to get at is let's talk about alcohol and boating in general. And there's a misconception that, you know, maybe I'm not allowed to, to drink and, and, you know, get, I guess, powered boats with big engines versus a small unpowered kayak. What I'm trying to get at is there really isn't much difference in the law uh, when it comes to blood alcohol content. Yeah, that's correct. And, uh, you know, the rules are the same, whether it's an unpowered boat or a powered vessel, um, pretty much across the board, regardless, you know, one in five uh, boating fatalities has some type of alcohol or drug use involved with it. Um, so that's regardless of it, if it's unpowered or a powered boat. Um, you're out there in the heat. Uh, you really should be thinking about hydrating, about water, especially if you're out all day long and any type of impairment from alcohol or drugs is going to um, lessen, uh, you know, lessen your ability to make right decisions at a fast point in time if you need to, if you are boating uh, and it puts you at an enhanced risk. So uh, we'd like to say, uh, if you're going out there recreating, specifically paddling all day long, try to, you know, stay healthy, keep hydrated with water and keep your wits about you because there are a lot of dangers uh, that can be associated with uh, recreational paddling if you're uh, not trained and you're not aware of the piece of water that you're on. As we take a look at a little bit of uh, video here of some folks enjoying a paddle, this is actually Collier Lake, which is a Fish and Boat Commission uh, lake located in Center County. And just like the Fish and Boat Commission properties, um, so that people know that alcohol is prohibited at Fish and Boat Commission properties, as well as the state parks. So Christine, back to you. We talk about families, and I've spoken about my family and Adam's family getting involved in kayaking as a great group activity. Oftentimes a mixture of adults and children out on the water. So we touched a little bit on some of the scenarios involving kids, but what else would you tell people if you're getting involved as a family? What do you want to look out for when it comes to paddling and safety for children? Definitely a properly fitting PFD for everyone. That's, that's first and foremost the, the most important thing you should have before you get out of the water, <clears throat> especially for kids. Um, also, properly fitting uh, kayaks. So there's sit on top, there's um, you can sit within the, the kayak, and many of them have foot pegs that you can adjust. You can adjust the seat uh, support. So you wanna make sure that before you get out onto the water, <clears throat> you can get in the kayak, get yourself situated where you feel comfortable for the next you know, hour or so before you head out onto the water. So making those, those adjustments ahead of time will <clears throat> allow for a really great experience out on the water. Um, in addition to the kayaking uh, sort of types, there's there's tandem kayaks. So you know you can bring another child or another adult or you know your dog. You have some extra room to have some other passengers with you. Um, and again, you know if someone is limited in their mobility or have um, a vision impairment, you know a tandem kayak is a wonderful experience to, to have that shared outdoor experience together out on the water. So. Lots of wonderful opportunities. I guess the first or the most important thing would be safety. So make sure you're prepared with a good fitting um, life jacket before you head out there. I have a couple of questions from Facebook that are dealing with uh, one of the other topics that we were going to talk about today a little bit, kayak fishing, which is an increasingly popular activity combining both fishing and angling. Um, here's a question from Chris on Facebook. Uh, Adam, I'll ask you this one. Chris asks, I'm about to purchase a fishing kayak and will be taking it on rivers and lakes. How difficult is it to navigate a kayak on a river? Well, that's a great question. And it would, I would say it would all depend on the river um, that, that he's heading to. Um, 
kayaks are really maneuverable. Um, a fishing kayak that's 12 feet long or 10 feet long should be, you shouldn't have any problem paddling that around the river. Again, the most important thing you want to do before you head out on that river is to make sure you know where the accesses are, um, know if there's any hazards on that river, such as dams, um, even like bridges, anywhere where debris could get built up and cause a strainer that could cause you to get caught into. So you just want to make sure you do your research and know the body of water, that river. I'd recommend driving the river before you actually um, go to paddle on it. Drive down, check out all the accesses along your trip, the section that you want to paddle. Um, plan it out and then take somebody with you that you that wants to kayak fish with you. Take someone along. Don't go out there by yourself on that river. Um, wear your life jacket and have, have a good time. Is it a... I, I, from personal experience, floating down a river, a lot of people think, well, I'm going to get in there. I'm going to get in my kayak and I'm just going to float down the river. And in a couple of hours, I'm going to be at the next launch. And then depending on weather factors, specifically wind, you can actually end up going up river <laughs> pretty easily too, or sideways on the river. And it's not always a straight up and down type of situation. So um, for people who are looking for that relaxing paddle that they don't want to have to do too much, you know, paddling just to get themselves from point A to point B, what are some things that they should look out for beyond just weather or maybe plan for ahead in that scenario? So you, they could they could plan their trip on a smaller a smaller creek or or a smaller river such as uh, the Juniata River is pretty big, but that's a smaller smaller river than like say the Susquehanna River. Um, smaller creeks, you're going to have less of that wind stopping you into more options to put in there and float down. But you have also have to remember that there could be more hazards on that smaller body of water um, that you might not be able to see when you drive trying to check out the, the, the stream the whole way. It's easy to see a river when you're driving alongside of it. We have highways and like drive right, around, right along them and bridges that cross them pretty often. So you can see see the water that you're going to be floating down. But the weather, the wind, and the currents are are things that change daily when you're out there, um, and you have to be prepared to deal with them when you're out there on the water. That's why moving water's a a bit of a different ball game for safety and preparing than it is going out on the lake. Ryan, we have a safety question here dealing with PFDs or life jackets, but Jared on Facebook asks are inflatable pfds okay to use in a kayak yeah inflatable life jackets and what he's referring to by inflatable are ones that utilize uh, typically a co2 canister and either activate and inflate by you pulling a cord or some of them are actually hydrostatic or if they get wet they actually automatically dissolve a little uh capsule in there and they they activate and they and they inflate. Um, they do meet the requirement. However, uh, they're not necessarily 100% uh, recommended. You want to have something that's inherently buoyant. And uh, in regards to the cold weather life jacket regulation um, that runs from uh, November 1st to April 30th, they do not meet that requirement. So during that time frame. Uh, they need to wear something that's inherently buoyant. Christine, here's a question regarding another type of paddling that's really becoming popular. Of course, we're talking about kayaking today, but in general, kayaking or in in general, paddling is is uh, is extremely popular. And one of the newer type of devices, I guess, that people have been using for years, but are, are really starting to, to be seen more out there. Uh, and becoming affordable are stand-up paddle boards. So mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about stand-up paddle boards in regards to, you know, are they, are they welcome at, at state parks? Uh, do, do the same rules apply as far as, you know, etiquette? Do they mix well with, with the kayaking crowd? Where would you recommend that someone is interested in getting into stand-up paddle boarding, where they would, where they would start out? Absolutely, yes. Uh, Stand-up paddle boarding is another increasing paddle sport. Uh, yep, they are certainly welcome at state parks on our lakes. Uh, they are another great activity 
another full body workout, <laughs> just like paddling as you sit in the kayak. Um, it's just a different a different way. Um, sort of visualize surfing and, and kayaking uh, kind of come together. And it's also another area that's really interesting to see sort of develop over time is also uh, fishing from a stand up paddleboard. So, you know, those are some really uh, strong people. <laughs> they, they must have some good core because, um, you know, stand up paddle boarding is an option where you would lay down and kind of paddle out or you could stand up on your knees. Um, again, you can also stand up on your feet and paddle. Um, so there's a few different ways. It gives you a little more room. Um, it's less restrictive than sitting in a kayak. Uh, so it's really personal preference, but it's um, it's available at our at our parks. We do have some locations that have equipment to do programming for stand up paddle board. Uh, there's also concessionaires at the parks that offer rentals uh, for both kayaks, canoes, and stand up paddle boards. Um, but definitely, it's a uh, it's a great activity. Same same rules apply for uh, the stand up paddle board. You would need a launch permit. Um, just like you would need that for for a kayak, but it is it's it's a it's a fun a fun activity. So I would recommend that if you're interested in it. Ryan, here's a good question. It's weather related, safety related. Um, what should I do if I've done my best, or maybe I've even neglected to check the weather as good as I can? But especially in the summer when we get some pop up thunderstorms across Pennsylvania. What's the best thing to do if I get caught in a storm while I'm out kayaking? Yeah, if it's uh, if you get caught in a you know summer thunderstorm, best thing to do is to try to uh, get to shore, uh, whether that be uh, an island. If we're talking about the Susquehanna River, uh, beat your boat up there and just kind of hold out until the storm passes, um, and or get to a get to a shoreline and just hunker down until you know that weather dissipates and you can get back on the water. Here's a question about paddling at night. Um, kayaking at night, is it safe? And do I require lights? I don't know who wants to take that one, Ryan or, or Adam. Yeah, sure. You just need to, uh, for unpowered boats, you need to have a light source that you can utilize uh, in time to avoid a collision. So uh, more or less a, a, a 360 white light, um, even a super bright flashlight meets that requirement. Uh, now, however, if it's safe or not safe, again, that's going to just depend on the body of water that you're on, uh, how much powerboat traffic might be on that water. So there's a lot of variables um, that go into that. Night paddling is a separate animal than, than going out during daylight and paddling. So there's uh, a lot more preparedness that has to go into that, as well as experience. So we wouldn't send a novice paddler to go out on a paddle trip at night. Um, so again, it, it's just, uh, that's kind of something that I know DCNR, they've done some uh, night paddling uh, programs on some of their state park lakes. And, and that's more of a controlled setting where they can manage and reduce risk um, for those individuals that want to give that a try. Christine, is that something I see you're nodding your head? You want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Yep. Um, thanks for bringing that up because that was something I wanted to mention. Uh, during the, during the, the year, we do have, you know, full moons and, um, that's something that our educators take advantage of during the, the paddling season. You know, there may be full moon paddle, uh, programming. So check the calendar of events. It's a it's a unique experience, right? Um, getting out and paddling at night versus the, the daytime. So I would echo that it's um, an opportunity for someone who would be a little more advanced and more comfortable in navigating a kayak during the, the nighttime. But as long as you have your PFD and your, your light and you're with that group in a controlled setting, it's a great experience. You may even hear some really interesting, um, you know, night birds, some owls and something that you wouldn't hear or see uh, while you're out during the day. So it's a completely different experience. Adam, talking about different experiences, like the different times of year, a lot of people assume the boating season is the summertime. And that's probably when they have the most time. But Christine just talked about a, a moonlight paddle. But 
Uh, fall paddling has also become extremely popular. Tell, tell us why people are choosing to, to, you know, kayak well into, you know, September, October, even November. So that Mike, that's a great thing to think about. It's because of the foliage, the fall leaf changing of the leaves. Um, Pennsylvania has beautiful um, water trails. Um, the changing of the leaves make those trips very enjoyable in the fall time. Again, you want to make sure you're wearing appropriate clothes. Be prepared to get wet. Um, that goes along with any time you're getting in a boat. Um, you want to be prepared for those things. So the fall, you have a little bit cooler temperatures. But again, if you're dressed and prepared and have your life jacket on, you should be able to enjoy that time floating down many of the waterways across Pennsylvania. And Ryan, we talked a little bit about the mandatory cold weather life jacket requirement. But do you want to put the dates on that for people so they know exactly as we're while we're talking about fall paddling and winter paddling and even early spring? Those are the key dates. Can you tell us when it's when everyone needs to actually physically wear the life jacket? Yeah, so the cold weather life jacket regulation, November 1st through April 30th of the following year, and it requires basically any boat less than 16 feet in length and all canoes and kayaks you're required to wear at all times a u.s coast guard approved life jacket got it one more question here from facebook going back to the stand-up paddle boards um we had some folks excited that we were talking about that and we also had a question wondering if the PFD regulations are the same for kayaks and stand-up paddle boards. Yeah, that is correct. So uh, the U.S. Coast Guard defines a paddle board as a boat. Um, the only exception is if it's used in a surf zone or a cordoned off swimming area. Um, those two um, uh, cordoned off areas, then it's kind of more or less defined as a swim aid. But if it's out paddling on a state park lake or uh, out on a river, they still are required to have a sound producing device and a U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket. All right, guys, we're winding up, uh, taking a look at the clock here. We've been on for about 40 minutes. I want to thank everybody for their time and give everyone a, a chance to um, give one last thought. Christine, uh, our guest from the DCNR today, would you, you like to share something for everybody as as we get ready to say goodbye here for this session? Sure, yes, I would say um, if you're interested in getting out on the water to paddle, either a kayak or a stand-up paddle board, check out the DCNR website. Uh, look at the calendar of events as we approach spring for upcoming programming to try out the equipment and learn how to um, maneuver and learn the, the techniques and have fun. It's a great experience. And there's also, you know, a wonderful way to um, share time with your family or friends um, and other people that might be limited in mobility to get them out on the water and be fully immersed in that outdoor experience. Um, you know, the tandem kayaks, like I said, er said earlier, are a great way to um, have that shared experience. So just be safe, have fun, and do your research before you get on out there. All right. Thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. us today. Adam, mm -hmm. any final thoughts? Um, going forward, when you're going out there paddling, just make sure you have a life jacket that fits you properly and you're comfortable wearing. Uh, doing programs with kids, I realize that if the life jacket isn't comfortable and they don't enjoy wearing it, um, they're going to have a bad experience. So before you go out there, spend the time. Uh, spend the money on a on a life jacket that fits you properly and you don't mind wearing so that you have a good safe experience out there on the water and ryan anything that you have to add from what we didn't touch on earlier today yeah just echoing what everybody said if you're out there wear your life jacket kayaking is an enjoyable activity um seek out your uh you know local outfitter as a subject matter expert if you're looking to get into it and in addition you can check out the Fish and Boat Commission's website. We actually have a free online uh, paddle safety course that you could take a look at to uh, prep you and get you ready to go uh, for this coming spring and summertime. So there's a lot of resources out there available with the DCNR website and was talked about American Canoe Association and multiple other nonprofit agencies uh, out there looking to 
get people into the sport and do it safely. All right. Thank you. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to throw in one more question because I think it's a good one here from Jamie on Facebook. She wants to know, do you need a launch permit or registration to use rivers such as the Schuylkill River if you're not using a Fish and Boat Commission launch? Yeah, so you need a launch permit or have your kayak registered, canoe registered. If you're utilizing a state owned access such as Fish and Boat Commission accesses uh, and or you know state parks. So from that question that you just read, if you're using uh, private property to put your canoe or kayak into the water from the Schuylkill River, then you technically would not need uh, to have a launch permit or have that boat registered. Okay, and as we, we always recommend that people do, uh, again, contingency plans are big too. And for a, a small expense to give yourself, to open yourself up to all the opportunities, certainly you may, you could end up with bad weather. You need to get out early, you know, off, off the water. And if your best possible location, maybe you planned on going from private property to private property, but along the way something happened and the most convenient place to go is a, is a, one of the many state launches. Having that launch permit is always a good idea, even if it's just a backup plan. So appreciate the answer to that question. All right, I want to thank everybody for telling us more. Uh, we, we had Ryan Walt, Adam Spangler, Christine Tyser here today, part of our session. Um, kayaking and paddling in Pennsylvania, no doubt, is, is just such a, uh, a, an area of massive growth. It's important that we get this information out for people who are interested in getting involved and also those who are um, getting others involved to keep them safe when they're out there on their adventures. For all things dealing with Pennsylvania state parks and state forests, you can head to uh, and, and find great places to kayak near you. You can visit the DCNR's website, that's dcnr.pa.gov. And of course, many, many safe boating resources at the Fish and Boat Commission website, fishandboat.com. If you enjoyed this presentation on Facebook, YouTube, or wherever you found us today, please like and share and help us spread the word about our virtual outdoor expo. Our next session is coming up this afternoon at 1 o'clock, where we'll have a chance to meet the executive director of the Fish and Boat Commission, Tim Schaefer. So I want to thank our guests for joining us today. Tim will be ready to answer your questions at 1, and we'll see you later. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.